Of the pleasures and pains of opium much has been written. I took opium but once, in the year of the plague, when doctors sought to deaden the agonies they could not cure. There was an overdose. My physician was worn out with horror and exertion, and I traveled very far indeed. The pain and pounding in my head had been quite unendurable. To escape, whether by cure, unconsciousness, or death, was all that concerned me. Suddenly my pain ceased, and I began to associate the pounding with an external rather than internal force. Gradually I realized my solitary presence in a strange and beautiful room lighted by many windows. My thoughts were still far from settled, but rising above every other impression came a dizzying fear of the unknown. Presently I realized that the direct symbol and excitant of my fear was the hideous pounding. At the side of the room nearest the pounding I beheld a small and richly draped corridor ending in a carven door and large oriel window. As I attained it and glanced out on all sides, the stupendous picture of my surroundings burst upon me. The building stood on what was now a narrow point of land. On either side of the house there fell a newly washed out precipice of red earth, whilst ahead of me hideous waves were rolling in frightfully, eating away the land with ghastly deliberation. On the far horizon ghoulish black clouds were resting and brooding like unwholesome vultures. The waves were dark and purplish, and clutched at the yielding red mud of the bank as with uncouth, greedy hands. It could not be long before the house would fall undermined into the awful pit of lashing waves. Accordingly, I hastened to the opposite side of the edifice, and finding a door, emerged at once. I now beheld more of the strange region about me. The vegetation was apparently tropical, a conclusion borne out by the intense heat of the air. From the door inland there stretched a path of singularly white sand, about four feet wide, and lined on either side with stately palms and unidentifiable flowering shrubs and plants. Down this path I felt impelled to flee. I now viewed a magnificent valley comprising thousands of acres, and covered with a swaying growth of tropical grass higher than my head. Almost at the limit of vision was a colossal palm tree which seemed to fascinate and beckon me. I paused and sank fatigued to the path, idly digging with my hands into the warm, whitish golden sand. I left the path and crawled on hands and knees down the valley's slope. It was, as it seemed to me, only after ages that I finally dragged myself to the beckoning palm tree and lay quiet beneath its protecting shade. No sooner had I crawled beneath the overhanging foliage of the palm than there dropped from its branches a young child. Before I could arise and speak, I heard in the upper air the exquisite melody of singing. I saw that an aureola of lambent light encircled the child's head. Then, in a tone of silver, it addressed me. It is the end. They have come down through the gloaming from the stars. As the child spoke, I beheld a soft radiance through the leaves of the palm tree, and rising greeted a pair whom I knew to be the chief singers among those I had heard. They took my hands, saying, Come, child, you have heard the voices, and all is well. In Teloe, beyond the Milky Way and the Arenurian streams, are cities all of amber and chalcedony, and upon their domes of many facets glisten the images of strange and beautiful stars. Under the ivory bridges of Teloe flow rivers of liquid gold bearing pleasure barges bound for blossomy Cytherian of the Seven Suns. And in Teloe and Cytherian abide only youth, beauty, and pleasure, nor are any sounds heard save of laughter, song, and the lute. Only the gods dwell in Teloe of the golden rivers, but among them shalt thou dwell. As I listened, enchanted, I suddenly became aware of a change in my surroundings. The palm tree, so lately overshadowing my exhausted form, was now considerably below me. We slowly ascended together, through the ravishing strains of the singers, as if in mocking demoniac concord, throbbed from gulfs below the detestable pounding of that hideous ocean. And as those black breakers beat their message into my ears, I looked back. I saw the accursed earth turning, 
with angry and tempestuous seas gnawing at wild, desolate shores and dashing foam against the tottering towers of deserted cities. And under a ghastly moon there gleamed deserts of corpse-like clay where once stretched the populous plains and villages of my native land. Then a rending report clave the night, and athwart the desert of deserts appeared a smoking rift. There was now no land left but the desert, and still the fuming ocean ate. So the ocean ate the last of the land and poured into the smoking gulf. From the new flooded lands it flowed again, uncovering death and decay, and from its ancient and immemorial bed it trickled loathsomely, uncovering nighted secrets of the years when time was young and the gods unborn. The moon laid pale lilies of light on dead London, and Paris stood up from its damp grave to be sanctified with stardust. Then rose spires and monoliths that were weedy but not remembered. Terrible spires and monoliths of lands that men never knew. There was not any pounding now, but only the unearthly roaring and hissing of waters tumbling into the rift. In one delirious flash and burst it happened, one blinding, deafening holocaust of fire, smoke, and thunder that dissolved the wan moon as it sped outward to the void. And when the smoke cleared away and I sought to look upon the earth, I beheld against the background of cold stars only the dying sun and the pale, mournful planets searching for their sister. <laughs>